Welcome back to Live with Jane and Jody. Here we are, Tuesday, May 16th, kicking off season number seven. We've got some outstanding yeah. topics lined up for this season. Fantastic alumni conversations. Really looking forward to all the great things that we've got. And we're super excited to kick it off with probably the most important topic along this journey is financial aid. So... Uh, that's what we'll be talking about today. Real quick, for those of you that don't know, I am Jane Boris, one of your admissions representatives here, helping you guys get ready for that successful interview through the enrollment process and join this community. I pretty much work with the candidates whose last names are M through L, or M through Z, M through L. I see an L on the screen, so that threw me off. Uh, M through Z, that's how you guys got stuck with me, by the way, in case you were wondering how that assignment happened. Um, but I'm happy to help anybody that needs it uh, just get here and let's change the future of healthcare indeed. Um, for also everybody, please be aware we are recording this session. We love it if you turn on your cameras, turn on your microphones, feel free to engage in our conversation. These sessions are really built for you guys. So bring your questions. We've got a great presenter for, with us today. She's going to go over the basics of financial aid, but we really want to hear from you and what are your questions, thoughts, concerns? How can we make sure that you are confident and ready to go? All right, everybody, enough about me. I'm going to let my partner introduce herself. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Again, thanks for joining us. So um, Jane and I get excited when a new season starts. Um, so I hope you enjoy all the segments that we have in store for you guys. A little bit about me. So I, like Jane, work with applicants at the beginning of the alphabet. So I'm through A through L. So again, we help you on this journey, getting you ready for your interview. But of course, I would help A through Z, just like Jane does. We're here to definitely help each other. A little bit about me is I'm originally from South Bend, Indiana, so the good old Midwest. Been out here, though, in June will be my 22nd year, so absolutely love the desert, love Arizona, um, love the heat. I know some of you probably think I'm crazy, but I really do. Um, I have been with Sonoran now. August will be my 17th year. So absolutely love it as well. I can't imagine being anywhere else, but here, especially with these great ladies that I work with, um, as well as great teams that I work with. So welcome, enjoy this um, segment, enough about me, and we'll get started. Thanks for joining us. 17 right. years, she's a rock 17. star. Oh man, yes, I think there's going to be some competition between Jody and our presenter today. So sorry, Jody, <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off. I know you want to do a just, core value. Go right just ahead. Just a little. No, no, no. So I always share a core value. So the core value that, um, so core values, of course, are beliefs of our institution. The core value that I picked today is we do the right thing. So Sonoran University continues to work hard during this time by gradually bringing back students on campus, slowly while still delivering that quality education, whether it is online or on campus, as well as delivering effective patient care. Right now, we are approximately 80, 85 percent back on campus, which is that you guys see the energy on campus. It's amazing. It's fun. So yeah, that's it. That's a great choice. <laughs> Do the right thing. We are doing amazing yeah. things here, you guys. And being back on campus, we can see the results and bringing that synergy back together. We got incredible report this week. NPLEX results from February came out and yes. Sonoran University students scored 95% pass rate um, in their part one. Yes, so that's yes, fantastic yes. news. We are back to pretty much that standard normal of high pass rates, um, yeah. outstanding performance by Sonoran University students. So that's always yeah. great news. When you look at the overall average of the schools, I think the overall average was down in the 70s, but Sonoran University was up in the yeah. 90s. So we're killing it we over here. Very, very proud of that. Doing the yes. right thing. Mm -hmm. I saw a couple of hands float up. What, what do you got? Yeah. What's your questions? I think they were maybe clapping. Hi. It was yeah, just yeah, like yeah. a reaction, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All awesome. righty. Well, let's introduce our guest speaker today. Those of you that haven't had the pleasure of meeting Anna Borjas yet, um, you are in for a great treat today. She is a wealth of knowledge and information. And much like Jody and I have committed to helping you with admissions, Anna is definitely committed to making sure you feel confident with your financial success here and making it through the program. So Anna Borjas has been at Sonoran University since 2006. Mm -hmm. All right, so real quick, let's do the math. Who's been here longer, Jody or Anna? So I've been here since August. And I got here in November, uh, just after Thanksgiving. So the Monday after Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 Jody's the winner. Yeah. That's fun though. But man, thank you both for your contribution to this community. Like that is incredible dedication and true commitment to what we're creating here and the constant growth yeah. of this. So thank you both for that Absolutely. years of dedication. Yeah. And so folks, yes. um, Anna joins us. She truly is an expert in financial aid and making sure that you are on the right path and well taken care of. Anna Borjas in her undergraduate was in federal work study in the financial aid department. She graduated focused on financial aid and came here at Sonoran University. As you can see, she's been here for quite a number of years and then continued to excel and learn more to support you guys. She also got her master's degree and, and is really just continues to grow and make sure she's taking great care of our community here. So with that, yeah. um, welcome, Anna. Thank you for joining us for our segment back. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Um, I enjoy these these webinars that Jane and Jody put together. And I think um, it's nice that we can um, connect, you know, before you start um, your journey. I've always said this is your journey starts before you start the program um, and it will continue as long as you want to. So the really nice thing, the, the opportunity that I have is um, I continue to have connections and relationships with our alumni um, so that has continued. So, you know, for me, financial aid is not just a quarterly thing of just processing aid, um, but it's really just um, making connections with you all and making sure that we are there to support you financially as you go through this program. Perfect. Very Welcome. good. Awesome. Awesome. That. So how we're going to do this, guys, is, is so I put together some just generic, very generic questions. So we'll dive right into those um, here in just a few minutes. But please know, and Jay and I will go back and forth asking these questions to Anna. But do please take advantage of the chat and ask questions. This is what we do this for, is for you guys. So, so please ask whatever questions. Don't be shy. All right, so I'm just gonna dive right in. So, so Anna, what if a student's parent makes too much money? Can they still apply? Yeah, so at a graduate student, surprise, you are automatically independent. We do not want parents' information on the FAFSA. Um, so even though you may be still a dependent on your parents, maybe uh, due to insurance purposes, that's fine, you can continue to do so, but for FAFSA purposes, you're automatically independent. So the FAFSA will pertain to you um, and or your spouse or dependents. So if you file taxes, um, we will need that information, of course, from you. Um, if you didn't file taxes, that's okay too. You don't have to file taxes if you don't, um, if that's not a requirement based on uh, you know, your accountant stating that. Um, there, there may be additional steps you may need to take just so that we can confirm that the information you're providing is accurate, but please don't have parents, don't contact your parent and say, hey, I need your information. Don't waste their time. We don't want it. It does. It makes no difference in the world of what type of aid you would be eligible to receive. Um, so yes, if you are a U.S. citizen or a U.S. permanent resident, I encourage you to complete the FAFSA. Um, as it will allow us to, um, you know, confirm your Title IV eligibility. Very good. I, I think that's a great place to start. It actually occurred to me when I saw this question is our community is very non-traditional. We have a lot of second careers, uh, third career individuals that come here. So not of the parent, but what if the individual already has a strong, successful career? Is it possible that they would not qualify for aid? 
Nope. So the FAFSA, so Title IV eligibility at a graduate level, it's much more simplistic than undergrad. Um, so we are looking for three major things to determine your Title IV eligibility. One is making sure that you're a U.S. citizen or permanent U.S. resident, um, that you're not in default with prior federal student loans. So that means that you've neglected your federal aid and now you know they've gone to collections and stuff. I will say, though, right now, right? Because of the pandemic, the federal loans have been in a mandatory forbearance. So really no one should be in default. Um, exactly. However, mm -hmm. that forbearance is set to expire June 30th of this year. So just be cautious because the FAFSA is required every year. Um, so if you're not keeping on top of, you know, any Perkins, Parent Plus loans, uh, Stafford loans, right? Making sure that they're in an in-school status, um, they could go to default. So just make sure that that is in good standing. Um, and that's it. Sorry, I apologize. It's actually two. So citizenship and not being in default with prior federal student loans, that's the elig eligibility component. Doesn't matter if I have a candidate who, you know, from a financial aspect made $100,000 a year last year or made zero, they would still be eligible for aid because the main source of funding for graduate students is based on non-need, right? So need is not a factor to determine eligibility. Um, and we'll go more in depth with that as we meet, as we um, review your case every quarter, every year. Um, but yes, yeah, so fill out a FAFSA, I will confirm your eligibility and we'll go from there. Perfect. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah, I mean, that's the th key is like you obviously you're helping students with their budgeting and their financial goals. When does all that begin? So it depends. Um, so it will depend on if I have a student um, who say if you're residing here in Arizona, you may be much more aware of what your expenses may be when you enter school. Right. Um, we have students who live in the Valley. And so if they're just going from undergrad to graduate school, you know, their expenses may not change much. So we can start talking or reviewing their uh, monthly budgets at that point. But if I have a student who's from out of state, um, it might be a little bit more challenging to assess like, what's my rent going to be? What are my utilities going to be? Um, so we can have an initial conversation to just kind of see where you're at, what's going on, and then adjust every quarter or every year. One thing is, and I didn't mention this, so I apologize, but I it's not just me in the office. I have two amazing individuals. Um, so Danielle and Justin are going to be your financial aid advisors. Um, and they are going to be the individuals who are gonna sit down with you as often as you need to, to really review personal budgets and financial aid projections. Um, and the personal budget, I tell my students all the time, this can vary quarter to quarter, right? So what you're spending one quarter or even one year may not be the same for the following uh, future quarters. So we highly encourage you all to meet with us. Let's sit down, let's see where you're at. Um, I always like to stress the importance of, we wanna hear your story and kind of know what your financial goals are. I don't, I'm not of the belief to just take out financial aid because it's there, right? Let's take it out to help with your educational costs, with your personal costs. If there is anything that you're concerned about, so I'll give you an example. Having worked with so many students, you know, main concern is I don't want the debt. I don't like debt. I want to graduate with the least amount of debt as possible. Okay, that's a goal. So how do we accomplish that? And we may accomplish that, accomplish that by various methods. One, as I mentioned, the personal budget really being real to yourself and understanding what am I spending on? Do I need to spend on this, right? So assessing, this is going to be finance 101, assessing your needs versus your wants. Um, the other thing is we also work on a financial aid projection for our students. And what that means is we will outline your cost of attendance every quarter. So you understand what is a quarter going to cost me? Do I need that full amount? Can I make changes? If I make changes, maybe I can graduate with, le with the least amount of student loans, right? But then again, I may have a student who says, you know what? I can't work. I'm the only one supporting myself and I may need aid to cover my full cost of attendance. So if that's the case, that's fine. We just wanna make sure that you understand quarter to quarter what you're borrowing. 
Um, I've done this for many years. And one thing that I remind my students is by graduation, you don't have the excuse to say, oh, I didn't know I borrowed that. I didn't know how much I was borrowing. You have all the resources at hand every quarter. So utilize it, you know, reach out to us as often as you need to. There are three of us in the office and each one of us will be able to sit down with you, assist you, um, and have these discussions as often as you need to. Very good. Very good. Awesome. So I want to go back a little bit here, and this is probably my first question I probably should have asked before we jump into another question. So can you go over, Anna, what documents are needed for financial aid and where yep. those are located? So the FAFSA is the primary. The FAFSA is your free application for federal student aid. Um, the FAFSA is going to be needed every single year um, just because Department of Ed requires us to come from your Title IV eligibility. Um, if you are interested in borrowing federal student loans, so that means that as a graduate student, you're available or what we have available to you are the direct unsubsidized loans and graduate plus loans or private educational loans where you could select any lender of your choice. If you are borrowing uh, student loans, you also need to complete the master promissory note and an entrance counseling. So master promissory note is your rights and responsibilities as a borrower, right? So you're pretty much saying, if I borrow a loan, I promise to pay it back. Um, and then the entrance counseling, it's an online tutorial that will provide awareness of federal student aid. And so very simple, three documents we need from you. Um, I, well, my team will send out email communications to each cohort. So if you're coming in for fall or for spring, we will begin to disseminate those email communications to outline not just what documents you need, but also to remind you all of what um opportunities are available. So we will literally communicate the cost of attendance. We'll communicate um, how much you can borrow, what the fees and interest rates are for these federal student loans. And then we also go into uh, discussions of student loan repayment options. So again, while you just submit three documents to us, and then of course the FAFSA every year, the reality is there's going to be a lot more resources that you may want to gather as you're going through the program. Um, but nonetheless, we will be here to guide you, answer your questions, and make sure that every quarter we have what we need from you. If not, trust me, my team and I will be emailing you, we'll be calling you, um, because we want to make sure, right, that the last thing you're worrying about is your finances. We want to make sure that as you're going through each quarter, you're only focused on the academia and we can take care of the rest. Good stuff. Very good. Very good. Very good. We actually right, already so, have a good uh, question. Yep. Go ahead, Jody. Yeah. Is there a question? Oh, I thought there was a question. Mm -hmm. So let's say a student has received the loan amount that they're entitled to. What happens if an emergency comes up? Can they borrow more? So the institution sets a cost of attendance every year. This cost of attendance, we look at tuition, fees, books, and living expenses. Um, and so the living expenses, they're based, they, they are reviewed every year to assess the cost of living in Maricopa County. That's how we assess our numbers. We also survey our students just to further understand, you know, what expenses do they have? Which ones are the most challenging? Now, through federal student aid, we have a process called professional judgment, where students can request additional funding for dependent care costs, a one-time computer, um, emergency medical and dental costs. So these are things that we assess on a case-by-case, -case, right? We can't guarantee that just because you may have some certain expenses that we can cover these. Um, I know in the past, some students have reached out and said, hey, you know, I have credit card bills. Can I get more aid for that? Absolutely not. Everything that is uh, approved through Title IV has to be uh, approved through the Department of Education, right? So everything needs to be, the cost of attendance components needs to be a component approved by Department of Ed. If it is, then we can go ahead and offer assistance for that. So one thing that I that I you know inform students is 
The institution has a set cost of attendance. That is the maximum we can provide every single quarter. So if you need more, then we really need to assess your budget. You know, where are you at? What's going on? Because again, we are mandated by Department of Ed, so we can't just give you any amount. Everything has to be accounted for. Um, so we really stress the importance of you of you all working on your personal budget, really assessing what am I spending on, um, and you know, and then going from there. For the current 22-23 award year, just to give everybody some perspective, our cost of attendance allows students to borrow aid for tuition, fees, and a maximum of $10,800 per quarter for living expenses. So think about that a little bit, right? So if I give you $10,800, a quarter is roughly three months, we divide that by three, that's roughly around $3,600 a month that you have to budget with, okay? So that would be the maximum that I can give you each quarter. There's there's a 11 weeks within each quarter and we will disperse financial aid every single quarter. Um, so really you wanna make sure that your finances are within that amount. Otherwise then we may run into a bit of, of some issues. The professional judgment process, as I mentioned earlier, it is a case by case. So if you do have expenses, you know, we are mandated mandated to look at that closely. We collect documentation to validate what your expense is. And we may have limits as to how much we can offer you in addition to the cost of attendance. Um, so it, again, it's not just, hey, we'll just give you what you need. We do have to follow federal guidelines with that. But that is a conversation we can have one-on-one -on -one if the if something comes up. And I saw a few questions. Um, yeah, I was going to go back up there. One of the first ones was actually around GI Bill. So first of all, thank you for your service, Shamira, if you're still on the line. And ultimately, though, she brought up or the person brought up a great point of can they use GI Bill and federal aid at the same time? Yes. So we we are an approved institution for um, the GI Bill and uh uh, and the Yellow Ribbon Program. Sorry, I, I sent it out this morning or yesterday, and I completely spaced out. So we we do um, we do approve the VA benefits for sure. That goes through the registrar's office, and um, I assist with a portion of that. And you can you can apply for VA benefits in addition to federal student aid. Absolutely. Um, and I'm sorry, Dane, I missed your next question. No, that I think that was it. Really, like. Okay. Are they qualifying for both or does that lower the amount that they would actually get through the FAFSA? So with VA, it is it, it does not lower your cost of attendance. The Department of Ed has allowed VA students to get the full cost of attendance in federal aid plus their VA. So it is not part of their expected family assistance. Um, so they can get both. Um, and if that's the process, so I would recommend if you could please um, contact me directly. I will put my email in the chat and momentarily. Um, but if you could please just contact me directly. Again, I work with the registrar's office for all VA students and I can provide further links and information on what the process would be um, for that. And then I'm just going to go ahead, if that's okay, ladies, I'm going to answer the question of approved cost of living considered to be for student living in Tempe. Yeah, so it is mm -hmm. the cost of attendance is assessed for everybody living in Maricopa County. Um, so majority of our students live in Maricopa County, which all the suburbs are more than Tempe. Um, so that includes Phoenix, Gilbert, Chandler, Mesa, Scottsdale, so on and so forth. Um, so again, it is the, the Maricopa County record or data is looked at. Um, and then of course the survey that we sent to students, I do ask, where do you live, right? So providing zip codes and um, in cities, as well as if you're out of state. So because we have our online students, I also am curious to know where our, our students are coming from. So those questions will be on the survey just to get a better sense of where our students are residing. All right, so I know there's a federal work study question, but I'm gonna hold off on that. Um, well, I know we can jump into that in a little bit. And then when should we be scheduling our one-on-one -on -one appointments to discuss financial aid? Whenever you want, right? Yeah. So this is our first step of, of interaction and connecting. Um, if you wanna schedule a time with us, please, you are welcome to um, begin that process.
Perfect. I love that you can see the chat. Yeah, if you want to address any questions know, that you see exactly. pop up. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> exactly. This is a conversation with you and those guys. Jody and I are just mm -hmm. here. <laughs> We're just here for the recording. <laughs> for support. I love it. Hmm. All right, Let's, bring your questions in, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, like there's... Uh, how does federal work study work, right? If we do have federal work study, what does that look like with balancing school and family? So we got a couple of good questions here. So federal work study is part of the Title IV program. You do have to submit a FAFSA to determine if you're eligible for federal work study. That is the only type of program we offer that is need-based aid. Um, so we will look at your expected family contribution to make sure that you qualify for a need. Um, and if you do, then we will proceed with um, federal work study opportunities. Now, I will say this, students um, coming in in quarter one, you are not eligible to participate in federal work study. The reason being is one, we need to make sure that you enroll, that you matriculate into the program. And number two, being that you're coming into an ND program, we want to make sure that you get your feet on the ground first with that, right? We don't want you to commit to a federal work study position um, without understanding how your classes are going to, um, are just going to be scheduled. We're in medical school, so you really want to come in and have a good understanding of your schedule, um, of your academic schedule, and how that may impact your personal schedule before committing to a job. Our, there are many... Um, we have a lot of faculty and staff who do hire Federal War City students, but again, we want to make sure that you have the time to commit to that department and to that manager because we do appreciate that help that we get. So starting in quarter two, if time permits, if your schedule permits and you want to participate, I will be sending out quarterly emails of what Federal War City positions become available. So every quarter will vary because um, Many of our positions, fortunately, our students will continue working for a particular department or, or a position. So we may not have the same positions open all the time. And so every quarter I assess those opportunities with our federal work study managers. And then I communicate with our students of the availability for the next quarter. Um, I will say that the first step is to confirm your eligibility. So I will tell you whether or not you qualify um, and then go from there. So I would just say there are opportunities. Definitely Federal Work Study is an amazing program. You get to work on campus. You get to really be hands-on learning in the field that you're studying, but it is a commitment, right? So I would just say, just hang tight. We will get there and we'll make sure to help you with those opportunities when they become available. Awesome. So Anna, real quick then, the next part of that question was, what does that look like with balancing school and family? Oh, Typically, what are, thank you. Yeah. that's okay. Yeah, what are the hours or what, what are the positions? Yes, thank you. So the hours are gonna depend on your academic schedule, right? The hours are gonna vary based on your academic schedule, what, um, you know, really kind of assessing your schoolwork and family and that can vary quarter to quarter. The average credits on a four-year program, you're looking at about 27 credits possibly, um, you know, maybe 26, 27 credits, depending on the quarter. So again, I'm very real with students. Your school comes first, right? Don't jump in and kind of look at it as, you know, I did federal work study in my undergrad, so I'm going to jump into my, my graduate studies and do the same. That's not how this works. Um, you are going to be, you know, it's not just the classroom, you know, that you have to worry about, but it's the studying. It's, you know, maybe you have to go to tutoring, maybe, um, you know, you have extra projects or homeworks that you need to work on. And then, of course, you have family, right? So prioritize that before committing to federal work study. And I'm going to put it in very real context. Federal work study is not additional income to you. It is part of your cost of attendance. So all it's really doing, it's helping to reduce your overall student loan amount. Federal work study, if you think about it from undergrad, if you participated, they didn't give you extra money. It was all based on what the institution's cost of attendance was. So they may have given you a Pell Grant, maybe any other type of grant that the institution offered you, federal work study, some scholarships your subsidized, unsubsidized, and then at the very end, they would have said, oh, you still have room in your cost of attendance, so we may offer you a parent plus loan. 
it was all encompassed in that cost of attendance. So it works the same way at a graduate level because federal aid is, is universal, right? There's no distinction between undergrad and graduate. So we're gonna do the same thing. So if you're doing a federal work study, it's gonna depend on the hours you can commit for that quarter and the pay rate. The pay rate is the same right now at 1385 for majority of positions, unless you're working in the medical center, which is $14. And many of you may look at that and say, wow, that's not a, a very large pay rate. The reality too is that we are a small institution and the Department of Ed approves our federal work study budget. And it's all dependent on how large we are. We're not an Arizona State University, so we're not gonna get you know thousands, millions of dollars in federal work study. We get a very small budget and I have to make that work for the entire year. So reason why the pay rate is not substantial because we wanna make sure that the federal work study is more of an experience for all students opposed to just kind of paying out the larger the larger payouts, right? So just keep that in mind. Again, it's not additional income. It's all inclusive in your cost of attendance. And then, Good um, info. yeah, estimated wage. So I just kind of mentioned the, the pay wage um, and stuff. And then scholarships and grants. So for fall, those are going to start getting awarded to students. Again, another communication will come from my office. I work hand in hand with the development office and our scholarship committee. Um, and, you know, because there's just a lot of moving parts with that, I we want to make sure that we have all our data, our budget's accurate before we disseminate that information. So if you're coming in for fall 2023, we will start sending out those notices Probably in the next few weeks, I will send out an email to all of our incoming students to let you guys know what opportunities are available from scholarships. We don't offer grants, so it's purely just institutional scholarships that we offer. Keep those questions coming. Good job. Good yeah. stuff. Hey, Anna, how often does the cost of attendance change? That is yearly. Um, so it's all okay. dependent. When we when I say cost of attendance, again, keep in mind that we also include tuition and fees, right? So we mm -hmm. do assess yeah. tuition and fees. Um, and there's many components that go into a cost of attendance. It is not an easy decision. Um, we have a tuition and fees committee, um, and it is uh, composed of faculty, staff, and student representation, just to be fair across the board. Um, and we do assess tuition and fees. And like I mentioned earlier, the living expenses. By law, we have to assess it also from a component of what are we offering um, and also look at comparisons with other institutions alike. Um, everything is monitored and everything is ensuring that there is fairness across the board, right? That we are not charging a student substantial amount or giving a lot of funding when maybe our, you know, a school alike, and I'll use, uh, you know, one that comes to mind, University of Arizona Medical College in downtown Phoenix and in Tucson. We also uh, compare with AT Steel. They're a health professional school that are located in Mesa. And then we have um, Midwestern University. They're also a health professional school uh, located in Glendale. And so they're the ones that we look at to see, you know, where are they at, you know, with their programs and such. And so we have to be mindful of the type of institution we are, the programs we offer to then uh, assess what our cost of attendance would look like. Um, so it could change every year, but there might be instances where maybe tuition doesn't increase for whatever reason. So perfect example, when we were going through the pandemic, the committee felt like we shouldn't be increasing tuition just to really help out our students. So there was no tuition increase for that year. Um, but again, that is a that is a decision that is reviewed every year and approval is provided by our board of trustees. So again, very, very detailed information and making sure that we're serving the students first and foremost. Very good. I like that it's a thorough review that it does include students on the panel like it's not just one person saying yeah charge more <laughs> i don't think any one of us would want to make that decision <laughs> right exactly exactly mm -hmm. 
I was looking through our list here of questions and we kind of have a few around budgeting, right? That's so important month by month, yeah. quarter by quarter. Like, do you have a specific tool or something that you give them or an app or what is it that you help people build a budget? Uh, what is like the biggest pitfalls that you see? How do people fall off their budget? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we keep it as simple. There's three of us in the office and there's a lot of students. And so we try to, you know, use time wisely. And so, you know, you all can use whatever gadgets, whatever apps you feel comfortable using that will make sure to keep you on track month to month. Our, our, one of our gadgets is a simple spreadsheet. I, you know, one of the biggest, biggest things that we look at is how much did you get this quarter? What are your expenses? How much should you have left over? And then what do we do with that money? So that's where we start looking at short-term, long-term financial goals, right? We start building financial buckets, very simple conversations. We're not going to elevate this to talk about investments or, you know, let's open up a money market account or a CD or whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. That is language out of our expertise um, that I tell my staff, we don't even touch those um, languages. Um, but for just really kind of knowing how much am I bringing in? What do I have to pay? And how much should I have left over? That's a simple spreadsheet that we really start documenting your numbers um, to the nitty gritty. So what I mean by that is, I will ask very um, difficult questions, which means like, tell me what you spend on, right? So if you say to me, hey, I am going to the medicinary every day to buy snacks, I will ask you, hey, maybe you should get a Costco card, head to Costco and get some snacks there um, and save yourself a little bit of money instead of going to the medicinary. Not that I don't support you spending at the medicinary, but if you're living off of your student loans, you really want to make sure that you're taking care of that money as best as you can. One of the things, actually, I'm going to ask this to the group because everybody, I feel like we're the ones always talking. So can anybody shout out or put in the chat what you all believe is the biggest challenge our students um, spend the most on and reason why they fall off track? So anybody. Nice. Brand. Okay. Brand. Thank Brand. you for those that okay. responded. So yeah. yay to those mm -hmm. that said food. Yes. Food is the biggest expense my students make. Why? Because mm -hmm. love my students, love every single one of them, but they will go grocery shopping, spend on food, and then guess what they'll do? They'll eat out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they'll eat out. And then sometimes the food they bought, well, it just goes to waste. <laughs> so um, that is the most challenging, right? Um, organic food for sure. But I will say, you know, a lot of our students get very creative. They'll go to farmer's market. Um, you know, they will get very creative to make sure that they're saving on their food consumption. But at the same time, you know, when it's midterms, when it's final, students will say, you know right. what, Anna, it's just easier to just go down the street and get some food, even though I know I have food at home, um, yeah. which is understandable. We are not here to judge. We're not here to tell you all, don't do this, don't do that. But if you are coming to us to say, hey, how can I save money? We're going to have a real heart to heart conversation. Sure. Um, and I think it's just important. You know, again, I want to hear your story. I want to know what you're spending on. Let's just be real. I had one student whom, um, you know, came into my office and he was like, I have no idea where my money is going. And this, you know, looking at my bank statements is very overwhelming here and literally handed me <laughs> bank statements. And so what we did is we color coded things. So I sat down with him and I said, okay, we're going to color code things. We're going to organize things. It turned out that he enjoyed going to the theater. That's where most of his money was wow. going, just going to the theater. And, and just that was his escape mode. And so I had suggested, yeah. hey, why don't you get a pass or see if they'll give you like a membership pass um, at a cheaper rate and you can like, you know, go to the theater without spending on just like these one time tickets, if you will. And he did, he looked into it and, you know, it may not have been a significant savings, but to him, it was this realization of now I know what I'm spending on and, you know, I can monitor it a little bit better. 
So sometimes mm -hmm. it, students just need that little push to say, I don't want to look at this. Can you help me look at this and just assess what I may need to do, right? So just as an example, yeah. um, I can go down a rabbit hole with so many more stories, mm -hmm. but it is possible for you guys to assess you know, what you love the most. And then we can have a conversation of, okay, can we compromise and maybe do a uh, something a little different to make sure that you don't kind of uh, eliminate that expense from, from your budget entirely. Right. But just being a little bit smarter about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good feedback. And I mean, it's great that you're willing to help like, yeah, come roll your right. sleeves up and let me and sit by right. side by side with me and let's do this together. Thank you for yeah. offering their support. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think we're on the what are the requirements for student loan forgiveness? But uh, hang on, uh, Crystal's got a really good question in the chat. What uh, she says, does the aggregate limit include past undergrad and grad loans and of how much? Good question. So graduate first professional level, excuse me, first professional degree level, which is what you're enrolling in. The aggregate loan limit for direct staff or loans, sub and unsub, is $224,000. If you have undergrad, sub and unsub, or even past graduate, let's say unsub, um, let's say you finished undergrad and went to get a master's degree or whatever, and you have more unsub, yes, those go towards your aggregate loan limit. So one thing that we do when we package aid every quarter, we will review your loan history. It is mandated. Um, one, to make sure we don't overaward you, but also to let you know where you stand, right? And that's where the financial aid projections come in. Because again, as we're outlining uh, the program for you quarter to quarter, we also want to show you how much you've borrowed thus far. So 224000 is the aggregate loan limit. Um, and definitely you want to kind of assess that as often. Let me put it in very simple terms how this works. If you have eligibility with direct unsubsidized loans, okay, and again, graduate level, you only can take out unsubsidized loans. The subsidized are no longer available. So if you have availability, if you were to borrow aid for only tuition and fees, your unsub will cover the cost, of course, up to that 224, right, depending where, you are, where you're at overall. But per academic year, the annual loan limit is 40,500. So your unsub will cover the full tuition and fees. If you need aid for living expenses, so if you need that full cost of attendance, you're borrowing the full 40,500 in unsub plus private student loans to cover that full cost of attendance, okay? So you can still borrow the full cost of attendance, but know that majority of that will be uh, private student loans. So I'm going to go back to reiterating this financial aid projection. Financial aid projection is it, it, literally it's a cost of attendance. We outline every academic year, every quarter on a spreadsheet, and we will tell you at what point or not at what point, but if you do borrow the full cost of attendance every year, you'll need private student loans and how much right? It's all a projection. So if, if you need that full cost, this is how much you need. If we make changes, we may be able to not borrow private student loans, but again, that's going to be dependent on what you need each quarter. Um, now, if you paid off some student loans, so let's say that by October you come in or April, depending when you're planning to come in, um, let's say that you decided, you know what, I'm going to pay, you know, 10,000 towards my student loans. If you pay towards a principal balance, that's money you have available for graduate schooling, right? So if you pay back, you have that much more available, okay? Um, I think, yeah, I think I answered fully that question. And again, we can have that, those conversations one on one. Obviously, I'm not going to share any details here um, of students' aid, but we would go in, look at your loan history to see exactly where you're at, and then do a projection to see how much you have available. I apologize. I think there was a couple of questions further up in the chat. That's what Jody was trying to get to, and I didn't All even right, see him. I zipped That's right okay. past That's him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So what are the requirements for student loan forgiveness? There you go. 
Um, so there's two. So there is loan forgiveness with income-driven repayment plans. So if you're in an income-driven plan, they have loan forgiveness after 20 or 25 years. However, currently the way legislation is, is documented is that you would have to pay taxes on what's forgiven. I will say the oldest income-driven plan is the income-based repayment plan. It is from 2009. It is a 25-year plan. Um, no one has reached 25 years of repayment. So I don't know what tax looks like. I don't know what the average uh, loan forgiveness looks like. There is conversation at Congress about eliminating the taxes on what's forgiven, okay? So that is a conversation that is happening as we speak. Whether or not it will pass, I don't know, but um, a lot of schools, a lot of entities are fighting to eliminate the taxes on, the, on what would be forgiven, okay? That's one. The other loan forgiveness option is a public service loan forgiveness program where if you work for 10 years at a nonprofit or government agency, after 10 years, your loans can be forgiven and anything forgiven is not taxed. I will say that that, that uh, program has been around longer. So a lot of borrowers have benefited from that program. It is real. Their loans are forgiven and they are not charged any taxes. So that's, you know, a really good thing. Um, so I will say this is that please do not come into the program with the idea or notion of I'm going to take out all of these student loans and then get loan forgiveness. These programs are federally mandated, which means they can change at any time, right? So Department of Ed can either eliminate, reduce, modify, they can do whatever they want. So never come into, you know, a program of higher ed to say, oh, I'm going to borrow the full amount of aid and it's okay because I'm going to get loan forgiveness afterwards. Don't do that. <laughs> I can never guarantee that these programs will be available um, by the time you graduate. So be mindful of that reason why we emphasize so much that you work on a personal budget every quarter making sure you understand what you're borrowing and also making sure that we're looking at repayment options so that you have a clear sense that as you're getting close to graduation, as you're looking into job opportunities and salary opportunities, you know, how does that impact your repayment status? So I'm just going to throw it out there because I'm very real with students and I don't like to, uh, you know, give students hopes if, things change and, and then you become disappointed at a later time if something is no longer available. So be very mindful of that. And then next one below that, is it realistic or even possible to go to ND school with no or minimal debt? What would someone's financial situation have to look like to make that possible? It depends. I've had students who mm -hmm. literally have set goals to graduate with $100,000 in student loans. That is a very true story. Um, this individual who we worked with, um, he was very adamant every quarter to look at his finances, to really assess what am I spending on? What am I doing? What can I eliminate? Living very frugally. But again, that was his situation, right? He, he had a very different background than other students. And so my biggest takeaway with financial aid is this is your investment. I want you guys to start rethinking about how you see financial aid. This is not credit card debt. We are not putting you through massive amounts of credit card debt or a personal loan that you have no idea who the lender is or what's going on. This is your investment to your education. So look at it as a home. When you go and get a loan for a home, right? You get super excited and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I qualify for $200,000 and I'm gonna do it and this and that. I want you to have that same excitement with financial aid. You have all the resources and tools in front of you to really make decisions every month, every quarter as to what you want to do with this money. So don't look at this as if I take out student loan amounts, it's gonna ruin the rest of my life. I have student loans. I was a student, right? And I'm doing just fine. <laughs> um, and I have a family. And so really look at this as your investment that if you didn't have this opportunity, you may not have gotten your education. So I really want you to start thinking of financial aid in a, in a more positive sense and eliminate all the fears and, and uh, cautions that you may have received in the past. 
been doing this for a long time. I get there's concerns and there's fears, but you have us as your greatest support to help you through this process. And you'll have everything at hand. You'll see the real numbers every single quarter. We're not, we're not going to hide anything. So again, you'll know exactly what you're getting into and what lies ahead. So I hope that that answered that question. And then, sorry, I'm just scrolling down. So the next question I look on here is what's the percentage of students who use financial aid loans to cover the cost of tuition? I have about 85% of our student population on federal student aid. Um, you know, again, I think it's it's having that authentic conversation with our students. Do you need financial aid to help you with your educational and personal costs? If the answer is yes, let's do it. Um, you know, we've really tried to work with each student individually to kind of hear their story and and you know really understand what do you need, right? How can we help you? And it's kind of like I, I, you know, I it might sound cheesy, but I think that's the notion of us being here for so long that the natural path principles are already so embedded in in our in our world, right? But think of it as a future physician. As a future ND, you're going to look for the root cause of, the, of your patient's problems, right? You are going to really dig in deep to understand why is my patient having all these concerns, health concerns, right? And you're going to really work with them to dig deeper and say, hey, we need to work on all these things, eating, sleeping, stress, so on and so forth, right? To tackle your health and to make sure that we get you better. That's what I'm doing with your finances. I want to understand what your fears are. Why are you scared of the student loan? What's going on? Let's put practices in, or uh, procedures in place to make sure that you understand and you feel very comfortable with this information. So again, large percentage of our student population is on federal student aid, um, but we will walk you through this process to make sure you understand what your what options you have available. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm trying to read the next question. Next one, it looks like are grants or awards given to naturopathic medical students? I understand that federal funding is lower for naturopathic medical school compared to a regular. I don't know if I understand about the federal funding lower. I, I'm not sure I understand that part because it's not lower. It's actually more. Yeah, I didn't. Um, yeah. Grants. So grants are usually given by state. We don't get state assistance. Um, so that's the main reason for the grants, right? And we have scholarships that are institutionally um, provided, or we also have donors. We have donors who provide us with scholarships. So grants, that is something that we definitely don't have for our students. But again, I, if you if you want to email me directly about your question about federal funding lower, because um, I'm not sure I understand that. The next one is, can you speak a little bit more about the criteria to be qualified for scholarships? Yeah, absolutely. So, so a, a variety. Again, we rely on donors to provide scholarship funding, but they could be merit-based essay-based or need-based. Um, merit, right, we're looking at a specific GPA to determine eligibility. Essay, you have to write a 250-word essay answering a question. Sometimes it's super simplistic. Um, and then need-based. While that we may have some scholarships if a donor requires it, um, it's not the most common one, um, just because a lot of our donors know that majority of our students have need. Um, so sometimes they, and I will say this truthfully, not sometimes, many times our donors rather hear about your story. Why are you here? How did you get here? What do you plan to do? And so the majority will ask for an essay um, so they, they can read your story and then eventually get to meet you. Um, you know, our donors are very generous. They will donate money to us. And so when they do so, they want to make sure that, um, you know, they know who you are and what are you doing to grow the natural pass uh, community. Yeah.
And then are students provided with resources to apply for scholarships from private organizations to help pay? So we don't have a list of private organizations. But however, if you do know of an organization or have connected with um, third party individuals, you're more than welcome to let me know and send me any documentation that I may need to complete for that organization. Um, we do we do complete those quite often. And so again, it's a matter of you letting us know whom I may receive documentation from and we can get that going. Nice. So I'm gonna, well, I'm not gonna get too much detail regarding the, um, considerably amount of debt. So two things. So if, uh, James, if you can email me directly, um, because I have questions with that, and I'd rather not, uh, you know, go too into detail, but if you can email me um, directly your questions, and we can um, discuss what type of debt that means. So I'm happy to address that and, and, and go from there. And everybody has Anna's email address, correct? I know she put it, put it in, in there. the chat for everybody. So hopefully you all saw that. And you, you're more than welcome to also. So our general inbox is finaid at sonoran.edu. Um, and as I mentioned, our financial aid advisors, Danielle and Justin, can also help answer those questions. So kind of as I think about this, like it sounds like maybe the concern is, okay, they have current ex existing student loans and stuff are those deferred while they're enrolled here are they gonna have to start paying for those while they're enrolled here maybe that's where some of this concern is right now yeah absolutely so if you have prior student loans those get deferred while you're in school so you don't have to pay on those unless you really want to but you don't have to um if it's other type of debt like you know a credit card debt then that's a whole different story but definitely your federal student loans and even private loans can get deferred and I say private loans cautiously. Um, private sector is not very, you know, they're not very flexible to defer your loans for the entire program. Sometimes their benefits can change or their, excuse me, their conditions can change. I would suggest reaching out to um, your private lender and this is non-federal. So if you have, you know, Department of Ed or Nelnet or Sally Mae, um, they may be much more flexible to postpone your loans uh, post-graduation. But if you have other private lenders, you may want to reach out to them to say, hey, how long is this forbearance for? Um, I'm in school, you know, how long will you honor another forbearance? And we complete those enrollment forms for you all. So if you do have a Perkins loan, Parent Plus loan, um, private educational loans, and you need uh, them to be postponed, those forms come to our office and we'll be happy to complete those. Very good. So is it possible to spend as much time as you want in getting the degree? After one semester, you work for a semester to save up money and fun. There is a, a max time frame in which you have to complete the degree. Um, and that's more addressed right. by our registrar and our academics department. I believe right. the time frame, max time frame would be like seven years. So uh, we have a five-year track. Go ahead, Anna. You probably know it very no, well. Yeah, so sorry. So six and a half for a four-year uh, curriculum and um, seven and a half for the five-year curriculum. So Good yes, there is a Good maximum time frame and we are a track program. So, um, you know, you do have to complete uh, certain uh, courses within each quarter in order to advance to the next quarter. Good questions. You guys are fantastic. Good I love information. This awesome. Yes. One thing we didn't really touch on is is financial planning. Post graduation, I know you well, you try to connect them to financial planners now. So then we can start to look into investing in that loan repayment and stuff. What are our connections there? What do you offer as the next step after graduation? So it, it also depends, and I know I keep saying that word a lot, but it's very true because not every student is on the same platform. So we do work with financial planners. Um, we are right now going through a small transition. They actually 
you know, just like us, we had a name change. They're also going through a name change. So we have been on hold a little bit with them as they're trying to get all their marketing materials up to date and everything. But um, our financial advisors, they're a phenomenal. They don't charge our students or alum. Um, they know our NDs very well. Um, they, that's how they were re referred to me. Um, and so really they are there to assist you with any professional or personal financial advice. And so once we bring them on board again, you'll have an opportunity to start making connections with them. Um, and they can assist you as, again, as long as you need them to. But along with that, again, we're just going to have the same conversations as you're going through the program and post-graduation of repayment options. Um, I mentioned earlier I have a lot of connections with our alumni. So every year I have alumni contacting me to say, okay, Anna, it's time to renew my repayment plan or my circumstances have changed. Can we figure out how that impacts my finances? These are conversations that I continue to have every year. So I wanna make sure that not only helping you along the way to you know, borrow the federal student aid, but also making sure you don't default on your federal student loans, right? So making right, sure you know right. what your options are post-graduation um, and how to contact your servicer. You know, if you wanna pay sooner or you wanna take advantage of the timeframe of a income-driven plan, you, you know, we'll have those discussions so you know what to anticipate. Um, so yeah, so our services don't end just because you've graduated. We will continue those until until you pretty much say no, thank you. Um, so I haven't had any alum yet that have said that. So that's, you know, good thing, I guess. Um, but I have had alum who have reached out to say, hey, I want to end up paying my loans in the next five years. Can we set a plan to do so? So that is something that we definitely help with. Uh, thank you so much for your time. You're very generous. I just realized we are one minute over. Everybody stuck around. Thank you all so much for the great questions, the engagement, joining us today. It's wonderful to be yes. back in live sessions. Jody, what's coming up next? The next one is going to be on uh, May 30th, and it's preparing for medical school. What do you need to know? So we have an alum, um, Dr. Anthony Panaza, and a student, Zachary Burt. So Very exciting funny. times, huh? So yeah. Good stuff. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. you guys. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Appreciate and it. Thanks, thank you Anna. all for being here. And please, please reach out to us. We look forward to working with you in the future. So thank you all. Yay. Yay. Have a great day. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're